So uh, maybe a little background on, on uh, my personal history here will help you understand this talk. I came to CSAIL, which was then, of course, Project Mac in 1966 as a graduate student. I'm old. And uh, during my graduate time, I worked on Multics, which was this large time-sharing system we were building. Uh, I was interested in the I.O. system. I did some networking on Multics. And just as an aside, because that's not the talk I'm giving, for, for those of you who are here when Bob gave his uh, talk today, he had this board which hooked a PDP-10 to an imp. Well, in my office, I have the board that hooked Multics to the imp. It looks sort of like your board. But I have something else that I thought I'd show you, because it's equally cool. I actually have some bits from 1975. I have bits I've been keeping in my office for 50 years. I've been waiting to show them to somebody. <laughs> OK. The guys who built this realized that the interface ran sufficiently slowly that if you got a really fast pen recorder, you could actually capture the bits on a piece of paper. And here they are. That's a file transfer from the 11th of August in 1976 at 1751. There's a file transfer there. There's a lot of bits. Uh, but that's not the talk I'm giving. I just thought I'd show you some bits. I have a box full of these things. I haven't figured out what to do with them. And I got my PhD in 73, and I was lucky I was in the right place at the right time. And I got involved in the early development of the internet. I worked on the protocols in the 70s. I chaired the Internet Advisory Board in the 80s. And I've been interested in the future of the internet ever since. So are we done yet? No. And by the way, uh, this talk's not about AI. I'm sorry. Uh, never mind. I've become more and more involved in non-technical issues because the internet's uh, not shaped by technical issues. I hired an economist. I had a political scientist working for me. I'm currently collaborating with a behavioral psychologist, but that's not the talk I'm giving. Um, I'm actually going to riff off part of what, what Bob said today, which is, what are we trying to do right now? Hook everything up. Well, actually, what we're doing now, we're spending a lot of money on us hooking all the people up. The United States is spending some like 33 some odd billion dollars, some of which I'm sure will be completely wasted, to, to hook people up. But you know, we're solving the haves and have-nots of the digital divide. And I think maybe within 10 years, we'll be there. But it takes money. It takes mistakes. It takes time. But there's not a big research question here. But after this, are we done? Well, actually, no. After that, we're not done. Do you remember IoT? Remember Internet of Things? Do you remember this bright, shiny object for a little while, which has now been completely eclipsed by AI and cryptocurrency and, and large language? I'm still back there saying, how do we hook all the things up? OK. And there are a lot of things. OK. I keep underestimating. People say, how many things are going to be in the internet? And uh, I realize, no, trillion, no. Boy, am I off. Because that's sort of like 100 or so per person. You were talking about clothing. Daniela was talking about having, no, maybe 10 trillion, 100 trillion. And they don't have a lot to say. If you've got a smart brick in the wall, maybe once a year you'd like to ask it. Or are you feeling good? Or are you thinking about breaking in half? It's a very important question, but you don't have to ask it very often. It doesn't take a lot of bits to answer it. Uh, there's a tension here, which is sort of computer science wants to do faster, cooler, more expensive, more complicated. 5G. Oh, 6G. How about 7G? OK. And uh, bricks just know that. No, they don't need that kind of stuff. So we're trying to solve a problem that doesn't appeal to people whose optimization is performance. Go you know, to get your paper in the conference, the curve has to go up. And so let's assume for the moment we have solved the connectivity problem, because I actually want to talk about a slightly higher level problem. If you have a thing, what does it say? And in what language does it say it? And why do you trust it? And these are really formative questions about what's going to happen when we hook up 10 trillion things, right? So let's look at a case study, traffic lights. And by the way, people are looking at this problem. This is not an unsolved problem. I just want to use an example. There are about 330,000 traffic lights in the United States. And they, they have a fairly simple thing to say, like, you know, north, south, green, east, west, red, until time t. Of course, that assumes we all know what time it is. That's another issue, but that's not the talk I'm giving. When the world ends, we're going to lose track of what time it is, but that's another problem. <laughs> that's why the Navy is now teaching celestial navigation again, because they know in the, next, in the real next conflict they're going to shut down GPS first. It's a traffic light. Who can talk to it? Can any car talk to it? Do you have to belong to a club? Are the competing traffic light companies? And you can join one company and pay $30 a month and get some traffic lights? and talk to another, what's it going to look like? OK. And why do you know you're talking to a traffic light as opposed to some 12-year-old kid who's decided it would be cool to confuse traffic by, I hope, at least pretending that all the lights are red as opposed to green, which would be really bad. And 
we have a terrible security problem. There's 330,000 of these. How do you know that they're all traffic lights? Is there a huge US database of trusted traffic lights, and each one of them has a private key, and you download a database? People understand this problem. There's a protocol called V to V, vehicle to vehicle, and then there's a V to E, which is V to everything. And they're thinking about all these things. But the point is, every set of things is going to have to come to grips with these questions. Now, in a computer science sense, what we're talking about here is interfaces. Interfaces is the specification of how entities interact. Okay. So here's a fundamental takeaway I want you to think about. Open, well-specified interfaces create an ecosystem. The obvious example is the web, Tim Berners-Lee, HTML. Anybody can do a web page. Anybody can do a browser. You find HTML crammed inside of email. It's well-specified. It's open. It created an ecosystem. Closed, ill-specified interfaces create an app, a stovepipe. People are all bitching about the fact that Facebook has all my information. I can't get it out. OK, and I actually, I think if you got it out, you wouldn't want it. But that's a different issue. You can ask me about that later. But here's the question, OK. Is the future of the internet open ecosystems or stovepipe apps? Who's in charge of the answer to that question? My security question. This slide's optimistic. It says, what does it mean to say an app is trustworthy? I, we sort of know what it means to me an app is trustworthy. I, I, that's another talk, but that talk takes an hour. But do we know how to create interface specifications that lead to a trustworthy ecosystem? Well, I'll tell you how to make it worse. If you look at HTML, it was fairly harmless. You download some stuff, you render it on the screen. And then people said, ooh, let's add active code. And you're going to download code from a website you've never heard of before and then run it on your computer. Every com security person I know said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. You're all going to die. You're all going to die. You're all going to die. And they said, yeah, but we get animated dancing cats and the people voted for features. OK. So if we know how to make it worse, maybe can we make it better? The piece of advice, the old piece of advice, follow the money. Everybody knows that. OK, I love reading annual reports. Go read Facebook's annual report. It's quite interesting. This is not quite as catchy a phrase, but follow the control. What I'm getting at here is follow who it is that is defining the control over the interface, and you will find the locus of power. And really, the future of the internet is all about power, which relates to how money, as an economist said to me in 1995, the internet's about routing money and routing packets as a side effect. And well, once it got commercial, that's true. So uh, think about this question of power. But here's my closing thoughts. The internet's not done. The future shape of the internet is not determined. It depends on how interfaces emerge. Are they well specified? Do we create an ecosystem? It depends on how trust is managed. And it applies equally to IoT, or if you think that's so boring, I want to talk about something that's cool and fascinating and different. It applies to the metaverse. Okay. What's that? Well, you know, whatever it is, Facebook changed their name to go along with it. Okay, but is it a ecosystem? Is it a bunch of stovepipe apps? Is it a science fiction fantasy? Look at where the interfaces are coming from. I'm, supposed to, I'm out of town, but I've got to ask a snarky question. i just got to ask. How many people in the audience have read the book in which the term metaverse is introduced? Oh, God, you're so young. <laughs> Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash, 1992. It's great science fiction. They make great futurists. Go read the book. I'm out of time. <laughs>